Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Dr Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today I'm in conversation with Rachel Morris MBE, who is a British Paralympic sportswoman who's won Paralympic gold medals in both cycling and rowing. She originally dreamed of running in the Olympics, but she lost both her legs to complex regional pain syndrome as a teenager. In addition to her sporting prowess, Rachel also works with children with special educational needs and disabilities, inspiring them and empowering them to see strength as well as challenge in their lives. She's an all round brilliant person who also happens to be my very good friend. So I was super excited to invite her onto the podcast. In today's episode, I posed the question, what do people see first, your Paralympic goals or your disability? Um, could you start off by introducing yourself, please, Rachel? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Rachel, and I am a Paralympic champion in two sports, in so in rowing and cycling, and I, yeah, do lots of other different things, tying in sports, and now, yeah, being an athlete still, and looking towards the future when I retire and go into a new phase of my life. And the question that I kind of suggested for today's episode was when people see you, do they first see your Paralympic gold or your disability? And I kind of, first of all, I wondered what you thought about that as a question. (laughs) (laughs) So I was really interested actually that that's where you started from in lots of ways. I think it came in my head as soon as I started thinking about it because it's something in some ways that comes up quite often. um, But without being asked as a direct question and it's something that I struggle with a lot in some ways again it's a it's a very strange thing and the world's since 2012 has changed massively in what and how it sees people with disability um and perhaps athletes so Paralympic athletes um it's great that I often am far more am seen as an athlete on an equal but equally at the same time you're not at all yet and society is very very not there at all so on the surface everyone likes to think it's absolutely lovely um and actually there's massive massive struggles out there still um every day every day something will come up if i go out um out of the house so to speak um there'll always be something that comes up about my disability so it's quite interesting um as a point to start with and i guess in so in a direct sense to answer that I think that it depends who you're talking to so and the scenario 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 sorry that you're in at the time um so some of the time it's absolutely you are not an athlete you are nothing other than a disabled person and not even a person with a disability you are just disability there's and some people just cannot see past that still um, and then other people um, are so excited about my sport and what I've done. And so it's really interesting that there just seems to be a big, big difference in sort of where we are. There's a huge spectrum of um, knowledge and understanding and or lack of. <laughs> that's that's there's a lot in there, isn't there? So. In terms of, you said, you know, every day your disability is something that kind of comes up if you kind of go out and and try and do stuff. Can you just explain a little bit about what what do you mean by that? What does that look like? Um, So some of it's, some of it's, I still find really shocking. Um, I've been at the end of it for how many years shocking. And I think looking at and watching new people coming in I've got a friend who's become a wheelchair user um and is really starting to try sort of gone into this world now and I thought again I thought things were so much better and actually a lot of the time they're not and he's really really struggling with that um so part of it's verbal it is just the look that you get um and it'll either be completely patronizing or it'll be pity you're just going to get stared at because you're different um and then it's the other side of it is sort of the verbal side of things of people actually being so abusive rude disgusting to you just because you've got a disability and i guess 
um yeah Wow. I, I, the thing I think I, I, I kind of struggle with most in that as someone who knows you well as a friend is the idea that people would have any kind of like pity or sorrow for you or think that you're in any way kind of weak because you're literally the strongest person I can think of, like both mentally, but also <laughs> physically. <laughs> I always tell people, you know, when we um, when we went and walked Whisper, um, uh, your dog oh, yeah. Whisper, and, uh, you know, trying to keep up with you when we're out in the woods, like off, off track and you're there powering away in your wheelchair. And I'm like, how is this? My friend has no legs and I cannot keep up. Like, ha yeah, you're amazingly strong. <laughs> But how do you how do you respond to that? Do you respond to that by do you, do you just get so used to it that you let it just pass you by, or do you challenge it, or what, what, what do you do? Um, again, some of it depends on the scenario. Mm -hmm. Some of it depends on the type of day. I think it's funny. Again, it's if you've got a disability, a lot of the time people just see that it's kind of it's like as though you don't have any feelings as the person that you know it, it, i don't know it's oh i was kind of feel like people think that oh you've had your sort of emotion off with your legs there's no nothing left of, you know you're not going to get bothered by somebody making a horrible comment mm -hmm. um and there is a really that side of things um you know notice um it is yeah it's quite i don't know it's, it's just so strange and i just find it i guess i would never i could never and would never have made a comment to somebody I might ask a question but I would never have made a comment to somebody about the fact that they're using a the chair or they look different or I I just wouldn't and it would never enter my head to have done it before I became disabled and I guess I have so, so I struggle with that understanding coming from the other way at times um some of it I can, you know you can understand and you know children are learning that's different again um but again, often it's the adult's reaction that becomes the problem. So often children will stare and there's age group, you know, roughly that you can work up until they have to understand they are learning, it's black and white. And that some of the best comments though are from uh, children because they are learning and it's black and white. And they just say some of the most amazing things. Um, and then it's the adult that becomes embarrassed and tries to drag the child away or sort of, yeah reached out in a really stupid way and actually doesn't allow the child to get the answer so i'll always answer a question if it's meant in a, a questioning way so to speak then i will always spend the time to answer the question i'm lucky i can verbalize i can help somebody understand hopefully how i'm feeling what i'm seeing and how the world is from my point of view and so i sort of try to i guess yeah take the time to do it because there are a lot of people who can't or aren't confident enough or don't have speech and who would get stared at, who aren't seen as part of community. And so for me, I try and just, just to break down those little barriers occasionally, it might be the one word conversation. Yeah, it is, but it's it definitely depends on the day. So I just, I can't cope with this and go home and cry. And the other days it's just so to speak. So it's, it's just that thing that suddenly you've got no legs, so you've got no feeling. Wow. And that feels like, and I can understand why you would say some days you feel more able to kind of respond uh, kind of proactively and pos positively than others, because that sounds quite a big, like emotional load and responsibility to be carrying, saying that, you know, I am a strong disabled person, ergo, uh, I need to re-educate others, you know, on behalf of, of, of many of us who yeah. might not be able to um both lies and and should that be your job or i mean what what how can other people help it's funny i think i'm in a position a lot of time that i can do that mm -hmm. so i also have a number of lines i can reach out through or to to make people understand or to make people at least just that it, they can then choose what they do but at least listen at least try and understand and I think one of the big things is you know, when I speak and I, or I do something at a school or I'm a, a business, whatever it is, engagement wise, I'm very keen now to finish on sort of the note of saying, actually, all of us are going to get leave here tonight. And actually, one of you may not get home and start tomorrow the same as they started today, because none of us know we're going to have a car accident or if we are going to have a car accident or something else happens. 
you know, sadly, meningitis, uh, spinal injuries, amputees, because it's so many, so many things happen that people, it's that, well, it never happened to me type attitude. And which is great on one level because you don't want to be morbid all the time about things, absolutely. But equally, if it changed for you tomorrow, you would want to be treated the same as you're being treated today. Yeah, I remember very, very clearly the day I had my first and second particularly leg amputated. And the I went off the ward the first time after a same particularly the second time. And remembering just how differently I was spoken to, treated, literally overnight. And yeah, those are the things. So then having got into sports, having the opportunity to go into schools, having the opportunity to speak to people like yourself, um, to doing all those things, that's how hopefully that's how we try as you're doing in your work, in, in what you're trying to do, in that sense of trying to get people to understand that it's just part of life, if you like, it's not. And absolutely, I will be there to help and support somebody. And that's what I'm starting to do more and more as well, which is what, what I really, really like, because you can make a difference to someone's life. Um, and say, you know, none of us know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And um there's a um, yeah somebody who i used to row with at the moment who says uh, his life turned upside down but actually he is finding it very very hard but has been, he's been really shocked by people's attitudes to him um and suddenly he's a chair user and they've not seen him as he was before um as a multi-olympic medalist and suddenly it's yeah very very different very different world that's really hard. Do you think that you get um, a different viewpoint on this because you used to um, be, I'm a rubbish at the terminology, able-bodied now. Oh, <laughs> when you had legs and then you didn't have legs, do you think that that means that you view your disability kind of differently because you know how you were treated before versus now or? Yes, I, I do massively so. Um, I've got a friend, again, a friend who was born with hers and her disability and is physically very disabled but you would i mean phenomenal strength of character and what she's done um but she uh, she finds and we've had the discussion between us a number of times over that because yes she does see things differently because she's never had the chance i guess to be treated as able-bodied yeah. um and so between us, we really notice some of those things um, and the way that people are with people, any person with a disability, any person with anything that is remotely different, as you know, as you know hidden disabilities, exactly, it, it, it's the same thing. If people treat you in different ways. And actually sometimes it's harder, I think, with hidden disabilities because people just think they like that, your normal thing. So mm -hmm. that you look normal so how can you be have anything that's different how how is there a challenge like because you just look normal like what's wrong um and so there is that side of things that is also very difficult and very different i've noticed um and then schools and children i'm working with more and more is just sort of being aware of that side of things the hidden side of it um, and getting people to understand that actually they can have a really positive effect on somebody but they can also have a profoundly negative effect on somebody just by the way they react to them the first time they see them so what's that's something we all need to maybe think about isn't it like how how should we react i mean is it okay to ask questions or be curious or do we just pretend that there's no do you know what i mean we we are all curious people and we all notice things around us and if you're a wheelchair user and the next person isn't like i'm gonna notice that like i'm gonna notice the color of someone's skin it doesn't mean i'm judging so what's the right way to interact with that yeah, yeah, I think you're so, so, so right on that. Um, yeah, I can't get away from the fact that oh, I've obviously got no legs, that I look different, I've got no balance, that you, uh, yeah, you can't escape that. Um, and because I don't wear prosthetics, artificial legs, and I don't walk, I can't even hide it under that sort of guise. Um, what I do find really interesting, though, is if you start a meeting or you start a um, working with a group in a business. And if I've made the point, and I've done it on a number of occasions, that I've come into a room before anyone else comes in. So I specifically go behind a table so they can't tell that I'm a wheelchair user. And then the moment you kind of, I again, going what you're saying, I would use the same language as I would do 
if I was able-bodied. So um, like if I step around and come around the table, um, then suddenly they you can see this change in people's faces of, oh my God, now I can't, I don't know how to talk to her. Now, now how do I say anything? Yeah, the, absolutely fine. The moment for not an issue talking, but the moment you've got that physical difference, it's, you, you can just see people freeze in and then it's really guarded about what they say. Um, and I, I, yeah, if I don't know somebody, I wouldn't even, I mean, I wouldn't worry about what their words are in that sense. I think if people, just are making the point of talking to me or talking to somebody that's a great starting point don't worry about the type of words whether they're totally politically correct or not would be my answer um i think i i hate that because it just makes me become a clinical object in a sense because people are trying to um sort of yes yeah, step around making comments whereas and in the, uh, yeah there's quite a dark humor in the sense between other disabled people um and there certainly is on squads um where i train at the moment um particularly with some of the military guys as well it's a, a there's a definite dark humor but that's fine and some people feel really embarrassed by it who are able-bodied which i understand but equally most people end up if you have become disabled or you have a challenge for whatever reason mm -hmm. actually most people end up having that dark sense of humor as a way of coping um, and part of it is just coping and part of it's also making sure that other people who are newly disabled from my point of view come into it and start feeling at ease about who they are because if you can laugh at how you look in the sense of you know you don't have to be that's not it's not nasty to laugh in that way at people if you're doing it within a friendship group if somebody walks up to me in the street and has pointed out something oh my god ugh, you're disgusting you've got no legs which i've had a number of times that makes you feel pretty rubbish but you know, if a comment within a group of friends is i don't know it's a figure of speech for example a bit like you were saying again about the figure of speech um you know, there's so many so many phrases about legs about standing up like standing on one leg or there's loads of loads of phrases that just come up all the time and i think the more people worry about the words they use the more they come out and the more yeah. embarrassed they feel and then the more I'm trying to retract and get them to feel better and going back to what you're saying about whether I have that duty if you like or that role it I guess I want to do it in the sense of making or helping somebody else to feel at ease again so that if they're in a scenario with somebody else who doesn't have the confidence that I'm lucky enough to have now that I'm x amount of years down the line um I think that's a really important part of it it is Yes, that I do try and help. I also had the most amazing guy in my life um, when I was first disabled, and he. I used to sail at the beginning, and um, once I couldn't run anymore, I sailed. And he wrote a note. He was paraplegic, uh, wheelchair user, and he left a note on my car after one of the events and saying, um, "You're no use to me at the moment." but when you've had your i hear you're going to have your leg amputated when you've had your leg amputated here's my number give me a call and on the face of it that's not a great you know thing to say or to write whatever but actually in this world that's how it is and actually i'd much rather so in classification for paralympic sport you want certain types of disability to ah, form you weren't disabled it. enough for him <laughs> exactly i wasn't however once i'd had both legs amputated i was really useful to him and then we went on to win the world championships so actually <laughs> so you know extreme measures right extreme measures you know <laughs> absolutely extreme <laughs> wouldn't recommend <laughs> yeah. oh that's really oh i love that though i love yeah you're not you're not useful to me yet come back when you've got less legs <laughs> Exactly. Uh, here you are. <laughs> and what what yeah. do you feel about like this drive towards kind of more inclusive language? Like when people use the term "differently able," for example, what do you think about that? Mm, I kind of cringe a bit. Um, it, I, I understand, and I can understand where people are coming from. Um, but why can't I just be Rachel? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, that that that's a, there's a bigger question there, isn't there? About you know my my kind of 
opening gambit for this is do people see your gold medals first or your disability and actually like I kind of I, I felt inwardly awkward writing that because I don't think of either of those things when I think of you like they're both important and if I'm trying to like place you so I have a lot of Rachels in my life and so my children if I'm talking about Rachel they have to be like do you mean famous Rachel the comedian or famous Rachel the gold medal winner or Rachel who changes schools or you know and I have to clarify that way Rachel they like that one <laughs> yes <laughs> but generally I'm, I'm actually I think of you more as um uh, like I, I just think well you're just right you're just my friend um yeah. and and if, if there's one thing that comes to mind it's not your various successes which you you have both kind of on and off the sports field but um like your love for whisper and the 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 impact that you have on the children that you work with um <laughs> whispers there in the background I was gonna say, I've got an upside down dog at the moment um yeah <laughs> looks yeah upside down <laughs> See, when I, when, when I kind of come to you to mind, it's always walking in the woods with Whisper alongside with a ridiculously large stick. So, That's uh, the one. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely spot on. <laughs> no, I, and I think it's really important. I think particularly for people as if they're starting, if you like the journey into having become disabled for whatever reason and however that is, mm. um, that actually those are the things that, again, are really important because mm. that person is still the same person and it's one of the things I'm really sort of keen to speak about really now is and to get people to see that yes I understand there's words and actually slight tangent here but same token is in your um podcast the last one I listened to you were being interviewed um it was interesting you were saying about um labels and I kind of I'm with you on the labeling in the sense I think actually there's a time and a place for labels sometimes they're not helpful at all and sometimes they are just downright awful and just not the right thing and sometimes people react differently to the, them as well sometimes it's really helpful for somebody to have a label and sometimes it's not um, and again it depends on how clinicians react to them in medical settings um, and if they just see that label then that's when it becomes negative because they've lost that person um, and then they lose the, who they're actually working with. It's just the label. Um, and then again, as you know, there's a whole spectrum. Every label has a spectrum on it, starting as mild to severe, whichever, or from light to dark, the whole, everything's just on a spectrum. And that's about humans as well, isn't it? Just anybody who is anybody as a human is on a spectrum. We're all so different, which what we all say is so good. And yet, actually, the moment you are different, they don't like. Then the human race is terrified because you are different, and yet we're meant to be proud to be different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think it's uh, so differently able. I would go actually, it's differently different because the people that's the pe things that people don't like is the differently different bit. They can't do that bit. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of cringe at some of the um, sort of ones that are meant to be politically correct that are coming out. Um, and I, I personally don't think they're particularly helpful. And I think all you're doing is putting another label on exactly the same thing. And yeah, okay, it might, yeah, not just not sure. Um, but it, yeah, say, I know everyone, yeah, you need to have labels for certain things and for understanding as well. Um, mm. But we also need to work with children young people adults who are given labels so one of the things i'd love to be able to do is to work then with pick up labels in how you actually use that in a positive way so the amount of people that get told they have a particularly mental health issue and then are labeled as so you then get particularly some of the special needs children that i'm working with and have the amazing pleasure of working with because it's absolutely brilliant um but they are off they often react negatively to it particularly girls are diagnosed with autistic around 13 14 which is the age where they often slip through the net as well they don't get that don't get that diagnosis and at the moment if you do get it they hate it so much and they don't know where they sit then they don't so they're struggling with their identity anyway as you are as a teenager for just anyway but a lot of the girls really really struggle with that as a diagnosis um and so i it's about from my point of view it's about, i would love to work with people to try the clinicians and then the 
um, clients, patients, whoever, you, however you sort that person. Again, a label, but working with that person, you have to identify people. But to get people to see that actually you can use it in a positive way, so don't let it be negative. If it's not the right label, again, that's something that needs to be understood far better medically. Is that if it's not the right label, that actually when it changes, that it goes back through your notes and that label gets taken away and is taken back because people who have the wrong label attached also really really struggle with that and other than clinicians in the future react potentially quite negatively to a, towards a person again just because of the label on their notes so how has that so that's something you'd like to do more on is, is helping people mm. to understand their their kind of strengths i guess and and looking maybe embracing a label but understanding what strengths it brings as well as what what challenges does that that's pretty good summary yeah good i was listening well <laughs> very good listening skills by the way. very attentive <laughs> leading in nicely nice smiles <laughs> <laughs> so what would that what would that look like because it doesn't i mean you do that anyway don't you isn't that what you do every day with the kids that you're supporting i hope so i'd like to think that that's kind of what it ends up being um i think it for me it's more about trying to push push that further then okay. so trying to put it in a way that we can use it in a far greater way so that it's not just that group it becomes how ultimately how clinic, clinicians see that label and what they do with it at the time so the fact that that ch child should then or young person a bit like somebody who's been diagnosed with them ms multiple sclerosis or something like that in my way of thinking um i'm working with some people with ms at the moment and that's why that comes come to my head but um to try and understand that yes it's a label that's very negative in some ways and people have this immediate fear obviously of it's like being diagnosed with cancer you have that absolute fear of what that label actually means yeah. but again that label has this end and this end of it and there's a spectrum the average means you've got to have each end and so you don't know which end you're necessarily going to go into at that point but how you look at it and how you use your mind to then go into that journey has a massive impact on how you manage it how you feel throughout what you can carry on achieving if you give up straight away at the beginning you may have lost 20 years of your life you don't know at that point and so being to me being positive about learning how to manage it and again it's a bit, but it's about learning to manage that label really um, and if you give people support at the beginning then I, I'm beginning to notice a massive difference in a group of people that I'm working with than the people that aren't having that support at that point. That's interesting and what do you do just explain a bit more about um because i have to remember that lots of people listening to this don't know you and haven't heard all about your work so just explain a little bit more about what that actually kind of looks like and what could other people learn from that and maybe do themselves so some of it is um i guess again it's a bit like me being my athlete head i'm sort of i've got a bit of here and a bit of there and a bit of sort of so um it's not straight psychologist it's not straight anything in that sense um but so part of it is support through sport so using sport through cbt uh, so the cognitive behavior therapies the nlp neuro linguistic programming type different ways of thinking about things um and using the techniques that we use in sport mm -hmm. and bringing those across so that they're not medicalizing that label in the same way so yes what i'm doing is underpinned by that and by those ways of thinking but it's also then about giving that person so it, it, it's about not changing that person but it's about giving them the tools to be able to keep who they are i guess it's so it's making them stronger when everything else around them is sort of changing and they don't know what's going to happen over the next year to 10 years whatever it is in that sense of a label and for the special needs children the rest is about giving them the toolkit to be able to cope with scenarios that they're going to find harder than perhaps their able-bodied compatriot in the classroom or the the person who's just been diagnosed with MS at 40 who is suddenly thinks that they're going to be in a wheelchair tomorrow and their life's over 
and yes it is and yes you go through a phase of grieving if you like and i think you do as an amputee for your legs actually there is a there's a whole process that we do go through as humans but equally there's a whole load of things that we can do um especially as an athlete i've learned that i think are really really valuable um in the medical world and across into the mental health side of things that there are so many things that we can do to help how you think and i guess that's a big part of where i'm coming from so again that ms side of things using sport to keep you fitter for longer to keep you as strong as possible all of these things make so much difference to how you think about things as well um and then the special needs children so send special education needs disability the children that are you know some of them have been through trauma some of it that they have had eating disorders some of at early ages um some of them there's a whole complex reason reasons that they're at this particular school or that i end up working with them through other schools um and then the ones with disability they might not have anything as a, as a label other than the physical disability side of things but it's about teaching them as a 10 year old girl at the moment teaching her how to push her chair better how to become independent in her chair and how to use a sports chair but so that she can transfer into it herself she's paraplegic um so her legs don't work um and she doesn't have a lot of core so it's about teaching her how to do those those things that give her the independence now so a lot of it's been shown that if you teach children from eight nine to have those independent skills particularly as wheelchair users then they will go on to be independent where they can where and also if you don't get a child independent by as a chair user or with the mobility issues from the age of 16 so once they leave school then they're not going to become independent um, so we've only got a few really short years really to get these kids um, so that they are that strong that they are seeing why it's so important and that actually they they can do it because so often they get told they can't do it and actually they really can you bucked that trend though right because you lost your legs later didn't you and you are like remarkably like i i love and that's the thing i you know going back to that conversation about like staring and looking but every time i'm with you i i'm just amazed constantly by you and how you kind of move around and do everything and that sounds really condescending but it's not it's just I, I marvel at your body and how strong it is and the things that you're able to do um and yeah but you but you learned later right because you were yes. able-bodied when you were a kid yeah yeah as a runner and as an athlete um, I wanted to be an Olympic athlete and yeah. that was what I wanted to do but again sport for me I think that's why it's so important and that's why I really I really believe it has such a big place in mental health but also with disability is that you, it gave me the strength physically and mentally to get through something which i know a lot of people don't but also that was really really hard really hard and sport has had massive negative impacts on my life as well at times but also incredibly incredibly positive things and so again life's a bit of that balance isn't it really you get the good about every cloud has a silver lining cliche but one of the biggest things i live by i think is definitely that saying <laughs> and you've been remarkable in that and maybe i don't know maybe other paralympians have done this too but you've just kind of shifted from one sport to another when your um ability to continue with particular sports has has shifted and changed because your disabilities sort of changed over time so i know uh obviously you used to row didn't you and yeah. And, and now because of the, the issues that you've had since with your shoulders, then you've, yeah, you, a whole array yeah. of different sports you're trying out right now. I'd just be interested to explore that a little bit. Like what enables you to just move on like that? And is that typical or? It's not typical yet. Um, I am certainly have a label of atypical on that one. Um, I <laughs> uh, think <laughs> a little bit different on that one. Um, there are a couple of athletes out there doing multiple sports um, and, there are a couple that have shifted, mm. uh, but it's not a big thing at all. Uh, but they're not even to... obvious shifts though, no? Because you've done like rowing, cycling, now what, skiing <laughs> and tennis? I mean, but... yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, so I started as a runner, able-bodied wise, and then was sailing a not bit. Not so good at running now. 
complete rubbish has to be said. <laughs> it's just not my forte anymore. <laughs> my spikes still sit. You try hard enough, you know. <laughs> I just, I don't, I just give up. That's my problem. <laughs> but I, yeah, uh, and then I did sailing and offshore stuff and some big boat stuff, which I absolutely loved. And then I think that actually was one of the things I was lucky enough to have been doing um, when I had the amputations because I had a sport that I could go straight to. Mm -hmm. um and for me it was just so crucial that I carried on doing sport and it wouldn't have got me back as easily and wouldn't have managed half of what I've done again without the amazing guy I ended up sailing with Eddie um he yeah he I think so much of what I do now is based on what he did and helped me with um I wouldn't have the strength I wouldn't have the skills I think that's the sad thing is that it makes me realize I wouldn't have the skills and which is why I get so frustrated by people who are working in wheelchair services and all these different services to do with disability they don't have anyone working there nine times out of ten with a disability mm. and so they don't really understand the impact so some of the little things they think are really little actually are the massive things and if they're just it, I know everyone, everywhere's stretched, everywhere's financially stretched, all these, I learned, that's not what I'm sort of talking about in that sense. Um, ideally I am, but obviously, you know, life's not that easy. Um, but it is just about how you deal with those people, how you talk to that person the first time they come in to get a measure for a chair, the fact that actually you should be picking up, that they're not doing this, they're not able to get out of the house, they don't know how to get out of their car into their chair and back and vice versa, they don't know how to put their chair in the car. I, I'm picking up people who are my age, so old in my eyes, but relatively young still, I think, hopefully at 40. Um, but they, they're not, they don't have the skills to be independent, and yet they are perfectly able to be independent. And if you go through a spinal unit, you generally pick up those skills, um, but because that's part of the programme. But if you don't go through that and you become an amputee, but a chair user, I would still be sat in one of the old granny wheelchairs, not even able to push myself because I couldn't, I can't even sit upright in them. And yet my life would just be wasted and I could just sit at home. And I've done a number of people I've kind of come across now who are just doing that at our age, sitting at home, doing nothing because they either don't have the right equipment, they don't have the right chair, they don't know how to use their chair, they don't know they can drive, they don't know about hand controls, all these things and then I think I'm so lucky I go wild camping with wisps so chocolate Labrador I go I take my tent I've got a rucksack that works in the back of my off-road chair and I can manually push myself across Dartmoor to the middle of nowhere or in Scotland wherever take whisper and we yeah wild camp now most people think that's nuts and that's fine and you know, most people wouldn't want to do it that's also fine but <laughs> I did and I that's what I was desperate to get back and for me that's part of who I am is being trying to escape from everybody. I, I love that. And um, again, it's about kit. It's about having those skills and they're just so important. So that is what is so important. It sounds like that having, uh, you know, a good role models around you when you first were um, sort of transitioning to learning to kind of live differently um, was really important and just, yeah, I don't know, almost like people who just sort of sucked it up and got on with it really um, and made you realise that maybe you could too. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, this guy, Eddie, who I, um, oh, he just had the biggest impact on my life and everything I've done was since becoming a chair user is absolutely down to him. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, like him and I were together 10 years and um, then unfortunately in 2012, uh, and so I sort of started realizing that at the, at the beginning, I felt like I was totally crushed and crumbled and I didn't have the skills to manage, but actually he's taught me how to bash bearings out of my chair. I can mend spokes, I can do all these <laughs> ridiculous things. And so people give me a call like, Rachel, can you do this? Or can I do that? Or, and so I'm just putting some videos together at the moment actually on just really short ones on how to manage to look after your chair and things like that, because oh, people don't know. If you know, you can't do it. That's, that's fine. Uh, wheelchair service will ring. Um, if you get a puncture, you ring, you can ring and um, they'll come out and mend them. But 
they might not come out for three days. Now, if I'm in the middle of the woods, that's not a lot of use to me. So I really need to know how to mend my tire punctures and things. And um, yeah, as a cyclist, I have always done it anyway. But again, I'm just been helping somebody socially distanced um, to mend their tires because she'd gone over a nail and got it in her tire um, and she didn't know what to do didn't know how to mend it and she'd taken it to a bike shop and they had said oh no we can't do wheelchair tires I'm like they're the same thing <laughs> <laughs> you take them off the chair and then it's exactly the same but yeah. apparently they couldn't do it because it was a wheelchair one not a bike one so I was like okay so I went and did it for her I sat in her drive doing um her tire but it again it just made me realize because she's like well how do you know why do you know and I was thinking well it's because Ed like that's why everything I do now and that's what I want to base my future and what I give back and can do um in all of those things that we've talked about um is yeah basically through Ed do you think he knew what a kind of inspiration he was to you in that way or was he just one of those people that just it, it just did what he did and you just learned from him I think he in the at, like at the end actually just before he died he I think he really did realize what he'd done and I think that was really lovely and I'm really pleased that he did know um I think yeah he was he was a really funny guy it just he's a bit older than me and he was very um bullshit by nature I think it's probably the only word um he used to get himself into so much trouble and everyone would be like Rachel you're just not like him you're a posh sorry girl and, <laughs> and he just used to be so funny but he he just cared he would just he and I know he'd have done anything for me um and yeah okay life would have been different but equally he gave me everything that I needed in that time to then be able to go and carry on my life and be independent despite not having him in it which still hurts so mm. much but every time I get a puncture or every time I do something and I'm out and I get a flat on my handbike or something and I'm out I can mend it and I always think of him and it always just makes me realize you know I'm really lucky people look at me and go how do you do it I'm like Ed <laughs> oh, that's really lo it's really that's really like yeah I, I don't have the right words really it's really beautiful when you have those kinds of friends and whatever yeah. it is exactly that they've done but the fact that he's he's kind of always there with you is yeah it's really nice it gives you strength I think doesn't it yeah there is a big thing behind it I think yeah definitely and would you, you know, do you think that some of the things that you have done and achieved and, you know, so much of how you live your life actually is kind of in some way linked to um, your disability. So the work that you do um, with children and young people and adults with disability and obviously winning your Paralympic medals. I mean, do you think, how do you imagine your life would have been if you had have not, you know, become disabled? Would you have become an Olympic athlete or? I always wanted to be. So whether I would or not, I don't know. But yes, I would have absolutely tried. Um, yeah, doing nursing. I had a very different eye on my life, I guess. Um, and it's that weird thing of, again, every cloud has a silver lining of actually, yes, it's been pretty hard at times. Um, been some really hard hard years particularly the first 10 years I was in that hospital I was so ill on a number of occasions um as my legs got reinfected and, they, I was, and that was horrible but actually again some of the people I met through that time um like the physio um she was oh my word she was one of those amazing people and I was in um, Bath a lot of the time originally when I was when they were trying to bike save my legs and um I was 17 I was away from home hadn't lived away from home at that point at all um and it you know I just felt so young I guess and didn't really know what doing I was in a hospital um right in the center of Bath which is an amazing place um amazing amazing chance for my legs if they, they did everything they could and I did to try and keep them but also after they'd been amputated their rehab at that point I got from them was just phenomenal because I'd had so much damage done to them around it because of the um the sepsis and so they were just phenomenal but the physio um yeah I've stayed in touch with her ever since wow. and yeah she's she's a really important person in my life and I see somebody I'd still ring and say 
do you think I'm super doing this or what do you think and she I guess she became a bit like yeah my second mum and my parents felt really happy that even though I was in hospital and really quite ill a lot of the time that she was there and she'd have rung them if she needed to and she as a friend as well as sort of clinically um so yeah I think there's a number of friends I've got as well from that time that absolutely they're a massive part of my life and so you do see things and you look at life differently definitely but we all look at things don't we and so we all make memories and those memories have an impact on things that we then do in the future even subconsciously even if we don't realize we're doing it um you know we know what makes us feel happy we know what makes us feel good and if you're able to you always you know you choose those things and you develop your life around that um but yeah there's a number of people that i know sadly i mean desperately sadly who are sat at home who do nothing other than watch daytime television and i just find it so tragic because they are able to do things and yet they're not able to because they can't and yet physically they could if they were taught skills and given the support mental health wise to be in a better place so i think everyone like becoming paralyzed amputees life-changing injuries or um sort of head injuries all these things have a massive impact on how you live your life but actually we still have a life and we can still live it and it's just about remembering who you are because again i haven't changed I might be slightly madder than I was before, but I'm not anymore, <laughs> totally. I'm still, I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, I'm still Rachel. Yeah. And I used to love guides and um, did loads of camping when I was younger. I spent all my weekends out in field guide camping, loved it, had the most amazing time. And I've got friends from that still. My friends, my really good friends are based from guides still. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah i guess you know you i don't know you do you just have amazing things that structure what you do going forwards and again guides sport were what got me through when i was 17 having my legs amputated um and they did it was amazing and now looking back on it a bit hopefully slightly more wisely than i did um initially is that you can look back on them those things and take the really good things and hash that's where my hashtag support through sport is going to come from is learning what or taking what i learned and have used and putting that into medical context into clinical settings so that people can actually see you don't have to be an elite athlete you don't have to be super sporty but actually the lessons that we can take from sport help people with the you know neuro neurodiverse physical hidden mental health all of these challenges yeah there is so much there's it, you know just going for a walk really does help and people think it's just too easy to make a difference but actually it might be so hard for you to start doing that but having that set up in place so that we as a country can support people when things happen like that, I think is what we need to be doing. So tell me about support through sport. You have a plan? I do, I think, I hope. Yes. So again, trying to get people to see the benefits of sport. Okay. And so using, so again, so kind of going from clinical settings and working, if you like, in a room, sitting down and making people trying to make eye contact with them when that's the last thing they want to be doing specific especially sort of um teenagers anyway don't like doing that um and so if you've got hidden disabilities you've got all the different things that are often quite a challenge why do we then put people into a scenario which is going to make them even more anxious to try and talk to them about anxiety I, mm -hmm. it it just some of it just doesn't I, there's a time and a place for it as well but also what a lot of what i want to be doing is and i'm having i've got a couple of people i'm working with now which has been amazing to see that start to sort of start to change place but going out being outside so um i kayak quite a lot i also do a lot of skiing nordic skiing so cross-country skiing um but being outside is just 
so important to how you feel. So going out and doing those sessions that you do inside. So I'm basically a bit like, I guess, in the sense of forest school in the schooling system to try and get kids outside. It's about it's about doing that really for the clinical side of things or the support side of things so people can enjoy. So doing mindfulness, learning things like that to a really deep level in nature, being outside and doing it is far more applicable then to somebody's life mm -hmm. than doing it in a white sided four room yeah. hall room which doesn't actually resonate replicate their life um and so a lot of it is again working with kids who are really struggling with things and teaching things through using sport that they don't even realize then that they are having that support through and putting it through getting teamwork pulling them together so that they're actually they are getting the support that they need but without it being a counseling or without it being sort of things where they particularly teenagers really have a negative sort of like whatever not not doing that not doing that don't want to talk to you don't want to talk to you but actually if i give you a basketball and we go and play basketball on that court you'll talk to me okay all right and then i've had some amazing times working with some of these young people um through sport and so hope my idea is hopefully to get people out into kayaks for mental health support and for using sessions so um using nature really using nature to help mental health support um but using those using it as a framework from sport and where can people kind of find out more or is it early days at the moment it's early days but nearly nearly launching website level so and then i feel like i'm going forward so i'm really excited really really excited so thanks vicky because when i was in hospital a few years ago and our first conversations of both of us in probably i'm sure you don't I hope you don't mind me saying not the best places no we weren't um, the best places no <laughs> no no i think that's fair um and to be sitting here having this conversation now looking at a person who climbs who does sport who does amazing stuff academically and all the things that you're doing to for me to be sat where i'm sat as to say yeah having lost rowing which i thought was my life falling apart at the time as well as having both my shoulders rebuilt which had gone wrong and all these things that just yeah weren't good um to yes yeah, so start building that is pretty cool um, but, um yeah. yeah i'm really excited for you and it's it's strange it feels like a whole different person and yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it was that was really tough times, really tough times, like for both of us. But I remember for, for you, I mean, you were in hospital so long and you've lost all your independence. And yeah, it was really hard. And I did everything I could to try and be a friend to you in that time. But it's actually quite difficult, you know, like not I mean, you didn't make it hard, but as in no, no, you've got no legs and you've lost the use of your arms and you can't do the things that normally keep you healthy and well. Like, you know, there's only so much that like, hey, everything's going to be <laughs> right kind of, you know. <laughs> I think often we just sat together, didn't we? And just were like, well, this is shit. <laughs> yeah. And I think in some ways that was actually really helpful because there wasn't anything that anybody could do to change their scenario and situation at the time. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. Having, I guess, I think every cloud is a silver lining, but learning and my, seeing myself at that point and knowing that actually I felt desperate. I did. I felt desperate i did not want to wake up in the morning because i didn't want to have to wake up to the fact that i might not be able to use my shoulders again therefore not my arms because it had gone so wrong at the one point and that 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 was excruciating it was just so so hard um but yeah you're right you know having no legs and not a lot of arm working <laughs> wasn't a good place to be um but you know, I, I saw the best and worst of elite sport as well at that point. Yeah. And yeah. it also, but going from that, it took, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, because that's what I could do, um, but I did a lot of time on, on just structuring things about where I wanted it to go. Since then, I've done an awful lot of learning online, different things, um, as well as going back to elite sport, um, that, you know, I just... I, okay i'm guessing i'm getting there i can still be an athlete at the moment i'm still just an athlete and um as well as doing this now which is what's really exciting because for the first time as well i feel like i could actually walk away from being an athlete yeah. i um metaphorically could hang my shoes up there you go that's a good one <laughs> um and um i can hang my shoes up and walk away from it and go 
I've had the most amazing time as an athlete. I've experienced things that people would love to, and I've had that experience. Um, but actually also at the same time, there is a future for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very hard, a lot of athletes, it's, it's a very known thing that athletes really, a bit coming out of the military, um, people really struggle, they've lost their identity, labels, that thing of when there's a good one and a bad one, it's amazing having an elite athlete label, but then when that starts falling apart, or going maybe for injury, maybe you're just at the end of your program, there's time and place and actually how you use that label again is one of those things that's really critical yeah wow we went deep there the moment that was scary it's all good all i've, good. I've all asked you all the questions good. but there are some questions that came in um so let's do like quick fire uh questions yeah. on, on the question yeah. things so um okay have you had any experiences with doctors or hospital staff because of your disability any bad experiences with doctors or hospital staff because of your disability and how could they accommodate for you better that's a really really interesting one um i yeah i've had and it's always one of those really strange things when you think that medically i became an amputee or through medical i became an amputee and yeah medically they can't cope with you um so i've had a lot of negative side of things i come from a medical family um i was doing my nursing as well my sister is an intense care nurse my dad was consultant my mom a physio so i'm very medically family and it is very interesting because they will say as well they don't have the skills if they were looking at somebody now they see it very differently my mom particularly is very much well i can see things completely differently and the impact of actually that person. I think so much of it goes though to treat that person as you would want to be treated yourself. Yeah. That is the biggest thing to live by, full stop. But medically, don't see that person as a failure because medically, if you're, it's funny if you're ill or if you've had an amputation, that in lots of ways that's seen as a failure medically because they're like, well, we can't get you better now. And that's what medicine's all about. In, in you know underneath it it's a very simple view but they a lot of medics really struggle with it because we can't fix you yeah um but it is so much it's just about talking to a person about again about not attaching that label and going well that's all you can do you know but and also don't use ward disabled toilets as broom cupboards that doesn't go well with me <laughs> sorry i shouldn't laugh that's terrible like yeah. Wow. yeah you should but yeah. <laughs> yeah gosh okay okay so see the see the person see the person look past the label is the we've kind of maybe covered this a little bit but um your quick fire answer on is the label of having a disability helpful yeah we have kind of in some ways as well but i get what you're saying um yes and no i think definitely I, um, and again it's how you use that and how that how you deliver that label Mm-hmm. initially is crucial and critical that per the, the medic the nurse whoever it is that delivers that initial label can have an impact on that person for the rest of their life on how they do it and whether it has whether they almost write that person off at the beginning yeah so it's a huge responsibility actually yeah, i think it does i don't think people realize the responsibility they have as clinicians whether that is mental or physical health they do not understand yeah what an impact they are going to have on that person yeah yeah we face this sort of similar thing with um like autism when i got my diagnosis of autism and it feels like a life sentence when you first get it you realize well i'm not getting better from that (laughs) yeah Um, Yeah. actually you know i've come to understand that it's it's exactly like you said with 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 everything else really there are real strengths there too but it's about having those role models having people around you who who do see the strengths as well as the challenges and realizing that yeah there totally is a future here um it's just a slightly that, different one you know it is and it, it you can you know you use that label to uh, make yourself work with what you've got but to understand that you know yes i've got yes i'm a wheelchair user and, you know i but i need to learn how to do it so then i can live as full of life and do whatever I want as I would have done if I was walking same for you with your diagnosis because you've got it yes okay you're not going to get better as such right but you can make your life as you've done so much better by learning how to cope with it yeah and then your life is so much easier yeah because you're yeah yeah so you need to build in like 
ramps and grab rails and I have to build in like rest and space away from people. It's totally different, but kind of, yeah, it's about accommodation really, isn't it? And uh, yeah. Okay. It's just understanding who you are and what you need. Yeah. And I think being prepared to ask for help as well sometimes, yeah. isn't it? Um, which, yeah, I think is important. Okay. Mm -hmm. This I think is a really good one to end with. Okay. Um, um, what advice would you give to young people who are ashamed of their disability or uncomfortable with it? I think it's a, such a big area, um, such a big area and such a massive, um, yeah, thing I'd love to change overnight. Um, but again, I think one of the things is getting people to understand and that young person to understand what they can do to make sure. So, for example, if they're a wheelchair user, make sure they've got a bespoke chair, make sure they've got the right equipment that enables them so the chair doesn't define them so most wheelchair services most services most doctors don't have a clue about wheelchairs um and that's one of the biggest things that you can do for somebody who's a chair user is make sure that they're in a chair that is built to them for them so that it's not about a granny chair with push handles that means someone's just going to move me out of the way when they don't also, want me in the way. cool those granny chairs because you can get oh, really cool so chairs cool. can't you is it with, oh, is it with so kids cool. that do the the neat chairs for um yeah they're one of them that does yes there are a lot out there that do them um and uh, or they fund them um with kids and then yes there are a lot of um, we've got manufacturers in the UK who build, build bespoke chairs who I would go to um, and ultimately if there's somebody out there then please get in touch with me I'm really happy to try and help you um, either through Fuki or, or come to me on Twitter but um, it's it, really crucial to get the right piece of kit so that they're happy with it get the colour they want get, all these things are really really important mm -hmm. to that person um, and then yeah making sure they get the skills to teach you know, and as an able-bodied person, you're not, as a parent, you're not going to be able to teach them those skills because you don't know how to use the chair. Mm -hmm. So getting in touch with somebody, learning that actually asking for help for those things is where they need to, and teaching them that that's the right help to ask for mm -hmm. and for using things in the right way. Um, it, again, it's also working within the class. So I go into schools where, for example, classes where there's a child who's become disabled, um, say for an accident i've just been working in the school one with a child who's now a chair user and one's with a child who's an amputee and actually the amputee is just about teaching them that don't take his leg really that's that's all it is because he's a most amazing young child and he's just got up and started running on his leg that you wouldn't know he's so much better than he was whereas the girl is really struggling with the fact to say that her identity has changed and people are really they want to push her they want to patronize her and they don't have to talk to her and actually it's been going in and getting them to understand how to lay the classroom out better for her getting her included in PE making sure we get the funding so she's got a sports wheelchair but again teaching her how to get in and out of it um, and those are things that can't be done by somebody at school who's already there because those are just skills that they don't have but mm. they do have the skill to ask for that help and get that child that support so I think that's the biggest thing is um yeah get in touch with somebody who, do, who does know and will help you there are so many people out there but yeah that's what i want to build my future on is making sure that those children don't feel different and that they do believe that they have a future and that they can achieve the things that anybody else wants to and do you um are you happy to kind of help if there are you know I imagine there would be sort of adolescents in particular we talked before about that who might be really struggling with who they are and how they feel who just really need a role model like you had at Ed really like are you happy to be that person to to people out there I mean you can't be to everyone but you can, you know no but absolutely I am and if I can't then I will make sure I signpost you to the right person who can do it um and that's what our future is about in giving people who are going to get a label or who like me fight that label and say I'm not disabled it's only I'm only disabled because there's steps in my way rather than um anything else and um it, you know I guess there's a happy medium on that one but no I am I I'm really really keen to work with those people to find them to make sure they've got that support going forwards because they are that person they are not the person and or a chair person they're the person and the chair 
that's what it's about. That makes sense. I'll put all your uh, like contact details and stuff in the show notes. So, so the very final final question is that is is uh, um, whether you've got a suggestion of someone I should try and persuade to come on a future episode, and what question you think I should ask them. Ooh. Okay. Intriguing. Yeah. Okay. I yeah I think that you would put. So a couple of people as athletes that would um, be intriguing and quite interesting from your point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess it depends on what angle. So if you're, yeah, as a sports psychologist, that'd be quite interesting. Um, and for, for him, it would be very much, I think, where is the, like, where is the line in sport between sport and mental health and that person being so it, it one of the biggest problems in elite sport is that mental health is still seen as a weakness mm-hmm. and so if people open up about it um which is a whole other show and i'm quite happy to talk to you about that another time but um that's um there, there is this really big gap or void if you like between um the, the mental health and how it gets looked at and pushing it under the carpet because we think you're going to be weak as an athlete if you've got mental health issues. Mm. So therefore people then not asking for help and it becoming too late. And tragically, there've been some really tragic cases out of that. Um, and so I think that my, yeah, one of my questions would be for them is, yeah, where's that line and how can we change people to understand that in elite sport, that it's not a weakness and actually we can use that as a massive strength once that person's able to manage. That's a great question. Will you help me find the right person to uh, to, to to ask that question of and have them on the future? I'd like just try to try with that one. Yes, brilliant. Thank you, thank you so much for um, taking the time to chat with me today, and um, we'll we'll catch up like aside from this. Uh, yeah, that's great too. So thank you so much for having me. But uh, yeah, no, it's been really like I always love talking to you, and um, you know, you inspire me so much, like professionally, but also just personally. Like you just you're just out outlook on life when things haven't always been easy but you always seem to find a way forwards and that's I think really important sometimes it's just about getting through the next minute isn't it but so far you've always done that so it, and it, that is a really and it, uh, people use it as a thing don't they sort of just saying when things are really when your anxiety is that high or when something's happening that actually it's that minute it's the next minute it's the next minute and actually it is that it does get you through a day or a morning or a hour when things are awful and that's what you do so yeah i think you're absolutely spot on with that one it's a great place to start and finish <laughs> <laughs> any any final thoughts from you before i stop recording no thank you so much um, i just think it's really interesting and i think what you're doing with your podcast is great it's just about having people to think and also it's enabling other people then to link in with sort of support structures or answering answering their questions really it's great oh, i hope so well thank you i will hit i will stop recording and we will continue talking all right <laughs> thank you rachel bye thank you